started earlier. So I'm afraid the first two seconds are going to be chopped off. Uh, the first two slides are going to be chopped off, um, Joe. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, when we finish this, just jumping back to the previous slide, no problem. then we've got, no we'll problem. have that. So let's get back to the question. Accelerated. Simple farmer's sense, <laughs> says Pierre. Brilliant. Um, the defense systems approach, collaborative learning, action-led. So it's a combination, action mapping, experiential learning. There's a number of, of different um, thoughts coming through, some sort of recognized models, Joe, mm. and others uh, models that people are uh, sort of a, a reference to the, the ways in which people are learning. Well, yes, and also there are lots of models out there, and sometimes they're all about the same kind of thing as well. Yes, just so, really, sometimes just a different name. Yes. And Alex adds, of course, the, <laughs> the model we should all use. Common sense is always good, too. I agree with that yeah. one as well. <laughs> That's the one I usually fall back on. <laughs> Very good. All right, Joe. so carry on. Do you want me to go back to the other slide now or later? Just jump back to the other slide now so we can get your title slide. Is, uh, this one? Yeah. That's it. Okay, so we are. Joe Corey. Okay. And then let's carry on and, and go forward okay. a couple of and slides. And we've got that. So we've got we've that up that. there for everybody to see, basically. Exactly. So um, I found that using a learning model can, as I say, help visually clarify the structure of a learning solution especially one that maybe needs to cater for a range of learning preferences. So I've just brought up one here, um, not coincidentally, because it is actually related to the flip learning model, um, Kolb's experiential learning cycle. And this includes activities designed around reflective practice. And that puts in place the potential for learners to reach and be evaluated at a, at a higher level. Now, I'm going to really briefly explain what I mean by level, especially a higher one. So what I'm going to just briefly go through is a simple hierarchy of teaching and evaluation le levels, which I personally use, which I find helpful. Starting with entry level, that's basically evaluating the learner's basic understanding of the subject. Then we've got level one or two, that's where we want the learner to reflect back the core information that has been delivered to them. Level three or four, embedded and applied knowledge, this is where we want the learners to show evidence of embedded knowledge and that they've got the ability to apply the core knowledge that they acquired at level one or two, which is what they did before. Level five or six, this is a more sophisticated and personalized application of knowledge. So we'll find here that learners can, in some subjects, problem solve quite complex situations and dilemmas. And then level seven, this involves debate and thought processes beyond the established system of knowledge. And in some cases, this can provide evidence of thought leadership. So Kolb's experiential learning cycle and these um, pedagogic levels they are actually brought together in, in my version of the flipped learning model. And we've been using the flipped learning model for a range of Tata clients this year. What I'm not saying is that it's the magic wand that makes all issues go away, but it certainly has been good for clarifying a visual structure of our approach for some of our clients. And I'll just briefly go through the reason why. So my experience of clients is that they are increasingly facing a bewildering, very seductive array of digital learning goodies. Um, clients recognize how simulations and games are exciting, they're fun to engage with, how convenient apps can be, the importance of increasing use of virtual social communications, and how, effect how effective great classroom training can be with its human-to-human -human contact. Now notice that I used the word seductive because the client focus is often captivated by the learning tools rather than planning a great learning experience. And when this situation happens, it's the equivalent of us spending all our time discussing all the different kinds of paintbrushes, the pigments, tools, whether it's going to be wood or bronze, etc., that are available to create an artwork instead of focusing on what needs to actually be expressed by that artwork, and then allowing your selection of tools and the palette to be defined by that need. So what I'd like to go through with you today are three main things. 
first, what is meant by flipped learning. Then secondly, we'll take a look at the actual model itself. And then we'll look at the model as it has been applied and used for one of Tata's blended learning solutions. And I'll be asking you at that point what you might have proposed being faced with the same situation. I'll be very interested in that. It's always good to know all the sort of different things that other people would come up with. There's many ways to skin a cat, as they say. I've left some time for some questions at the end, but obviously um, please feel free to ask as we go along as well. So let's get through to the first part, which is what is flipped learning? Um, flipped learning is a more recent technology-based educational learning concept. It came from the USA, and it was defined by John Bergman and Aaron Sams around 2007, essentially in response to the increasing number of disengaged students in their classes. These were students who hadn't known life without the internet, and they didn't see technology as something separate from their lives or from learning. And this concept is also known as the flipped classroom. So, you know, if you're looking it up, it'll be under either. Joe, just one question that's yes. coming, which I think is actually relevant. I wouldn't normally interrupt. Uh, yes, no, please I, do. It's no I problem. I can't answer it myself. But Jim says, is flipped learning always technology-based, or I should say perhaps technology-supported? Does well, that have to always be a technology component? It doesn't have to be. I mean, whenever we've sort of talked about a very simple version of, say, blended learning, we said pre-work, ready, so that when people go into the classroom, you know, they're not coming into it fresh. Um, so, in a way, you know, it needn't be. But I think just this particular definition, especially the one that we all recognize from the one that Bergman and Sams have actually defined, they do have technology as a key part of it because yeah. they consider that this is the way the learners feel comfortable in just being able to pace themselves and they can access things in their own way. And it's something that's come to the fore just quite naturally because of the nature of where technology is exactly. at this point in time. Okay, so there it doesn't have to be technology supported, but practically speaking, it pretty much always is. It often, yes, yeah. pretty okay. much usually is when we're talking about it. There we are. Okay. But Thanks like so. anything, like these learning models that we're talking about today, some of them, you know, from the 1930s, 1950s, 1960s, you know, when some things went around, you can adapt them. So the most important thing is to understand the actual nature of what they're supposed to do. So I'll go into a brief explanation of um, the flipped classroom. So here we have the traditional classroom, which is being used for core information delivery by the teacher as a lecture up front. I'm sure many of us recognize that. Um, you know, especially me, I'm in my 40s. I certainly recognize this kind of classroom. The teacher is a sage on the stage. Students are then asked to demonstrate that they have understood the information that they receive in class through homework, which often asks them to also make the additional leap of applying this information to their own experience. So they have to make a leap of a level there. So what the flipped classroom does, it actually inverts traditional teaching methods so that core information is usually delivered online, before class, at home, and it moves the homework, in inverting commas, into the classroom. So in effect, what you've got actually is a simple form of blended learning, which encompasses the use of technology to move direct teaching instruction from the group teaching space, the classroom, into the self-paced individual learning environment. And this enables students to grasp the core content in their own time, at their own pace, and then it releases classroom time and teacher time to concentrate on application of understanding, which is, of course, at a higher pedagogic level. The note here, also, I'll, just, I'll just draw attention again to actually the educator's role, because it's, it's about both the teacher and the student here. Um, that changes from being the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. That is, instead of their main role in the classroom being as a performer, and the central repository of information, the teacher becomes the mentor and the guide. And quite often in these classroom situations, even the way the teacher moves around the classroom is different. 
they're not up front on the stage, on the pedestal. They're actually moving around quietly, uh, ideally, around. Well, sometimes it doesn't need to be quiet. Sometimes it's great that they're all talking. But you're kind of moving around a working classroom of organized groups. So just to go through what the students do. The students watch, the key thing about the flipped classroom concept that Bergman and Sams have described is they, they focus very much on, on online videos. So students watch lectures that teachers have recorded for them, and they also access online information at home, and they also communicate with peers and their educators or their teachers uh, via online discussion. And then the concept engagement takes place in the classroom with the guidance of the instructor or the teacher. Now, the other thing that's extremely useful about this approach is that the pre-work helps the teacher differentiate. So they can then create a range of learning groups at different levels within the classroom so that when the students actually come to the classroom, they can continue to work at their own level and pace. So I think probably people can see you know, how you know, some of the classes then become much more manageable for teachers in this situation. I'll just go through, there's some key factors driving increased adoption of this flipped classroom within education in the, in the US. I'll just focus on three of them. The first one is poor learning outcomes. The traditional one-size-fits-all model that, you know, a lot of us are used to, this often results in limited concept engagements and you know has have been having some quite severe consequences you know dropouts people having to relearn that sort of thing and then you know in the 2000s the availability of online video and increasing student access technology has paved the way for flipped learning or flipped classroom models and then um, what is now coming through quite strongly are results. So I've just quickly put up a recent report in The Economist of June this year. This is uh, about improved algebra and geometry test scores from the Khan Academy, who's very well known for using the flipped classroom method. Um, there's also an interesting thesis from the University of British Columbia available from January this year which is actually all about students' perceptions of the flipped classroom and what they like about it. Um, also, uh, Donald Clark, he's mentioned uh, extensively the flipped classroom in all sorts of different kinds of contexts within his blog. Um, I've included links to these and other information sources related to this talk at the end of the PowerPoint, or Donald can pop some of them up for you within the chat space. Okay. So let's now have a look at the flipped learning model itself. So this is adapted from the school's environment and ready to be applied to training and blended learning solutions, which we are more used to having to deal with. So I've taken the Bergman and Sam's flipped classroom concept, and I've re-emphasized its links to Kolb's experiential learning cycle. And then I've included a range of learning tools beyond online video. So let's briefly take a closer look at the four stages of this model. The first part, or the first stage of this model, is information and concept exploration. And its equivalent level, which I talked to you about earlier, <coughs> is level one or two, where the learner receives and reflects back core information that has been delivered to them. And this is a, you know, a key stage. It establishes self-paced learning delivered online. Uh, the learner can gather information and explore concepts through a variety of formats. We've got things like YouTube, podcasts, content-rich websites, nuggets of e-learning. And I've put in online chats as well, because keeping an element of shared communication throughout all four stages is really important. So I'll just take a drink of water, Alan. Um, getting in the possibility, <coughs> and I speak as a teacher here as well, of peer-to-peer -peer learning really, really helps you in your job as an educator or as a learning designer. And it's also a great motivator within the self-paced learning environment. Getting that sharing in, that does half the job for you. 
So the second part of the model is experiential engagement, and its equivalent level is level three or four. And this is where learners embed and apply the core knowledge. So this can take place within a monitored live or virtual classroom and through assessed exploratory interactive activities, such as scenario-based simulations, for example. And so learners engage with their learning by experiencing things like hands-on activities, games, experiments, creative tasks, both individually and collaboratively. That's quite important that they get both. The third part of the model is demonstration and application. And its equivalent level is level five or six, where learners personalize their application of the knowledge. So asking people to present their knowledge to their peers or to problem solve more complex situations and dilemmas close to their own working situation, that is what is really effective here. So learners need to be asked to demonstrate and apply their understanding of the learning through, through often through creative, personalized projects and presentations, which can then be shared with others. And then the fourth part of the model is reflection and evaluation. Its equivalent level is level seven, where the learner is involved in debate and thought processes beyond the established system of knowledge. So learners can reflect on their learning by blogging, reflective podcasts, reflective vodcasts, and through tasks that encourage self-evaluation as well. Now you'll notice um, it's, the model is quite cyclical. It has an ongoing nature. You can use all four stages of the model to achieve a single level if you want, and then go around it again to achieve the next level. The reflective part of the model is something I usually advise clients to carry on elements of all the way through. So you could get people, say, right from the start to use something like a learning journal, and this could take the physical form of a notebook and pen, or a digital form, something like Microsoft OneNote, for example. And the shared communication with the peers, as well as the main mentor, this can also take more than one other form than a VLE. I mean, I've seen very successful monitored Facebook groups, groups um, as well as live group classroom events. I've just noticed a little thing saying, where can someone find more about these levels? The levels I'm talking about are some, some quite key, that I learned them through my PGC, actually, through teaching, um, and just being, have to be absolutely clear about, you know, very, very precise about what learners both needed to do and what they needed to be evaluated on. Um, so I think within the uh, recording, I think there's a nice slide there with those levels uh, for you. So, um, uh, you know, you can look further into that. So we'll go on to the third stage now. And this is something um, that I'm very interested in hearing about from you. We're going to look at how the flipped learning model has been applied to some of the larger and more complex blended learning solutions um, at Tata. Um, I'm going to take you through an example of what we were presented with at Tata, and then I'd like you to consider what kind of learning solution you might have come up with before I reveal ours. Now, that's probably a bit mean, because I'm only giving you about five minutes, and we had a bit longer to think about it than you did. But also quite interesting to hear some knee-jerk reactions um, about wh what people think might have been suitable. So, and I'll do a little summary of this whole thing for you to look at while you're thinking about answering the question um, after I've gone through it. So the client currently has in place a 12-month accelerated leadership learning program. The target audience is up-and-coming leaders from management and senior management. And one of the key elements is breakthrough performance coaching, which is a very particular kind of coaching. And has quite a lot of actual, um, quite specific language used within it as well. So um, there's a four-day learning event, which is actually classroom-based in October. It's for about 260 um, attendees. Um, sorry, I'll just get to here. A substantial part of what is currently delivered during the actual learning event, the four-day event, is core information. And it has been noticed that, or noted rather, that in past programs, attendees have been frustrated 
that they've not had a chance to actually contribute during the learning event. Uh, throughout the year, there's also individual coaching sessions. Feedback is provided throughout the year, as well as follow-up learning after the learning event. And the communication that's been used to date is usually through email, PowerPoints, and PDFs. So, what learning solution would you propose? And I've summarised, I think, what I just went through. You so, think about. We're, not, we're going to ask. We're asking our audience, and you, you've summarised it there. That we're looking for a, a 12-month accelerated leadership learning program. Halfway point, there has been a four-day learning event. What sort of answer? What form of answer are you expecting from people? Because if somebody had enough time, they could write something that would be uh, very substantial. Um, we're asking for a, a short paragraph that describes the learning solution, I guess. Is that fair enough, Jo? Yes, I think it is very fair enough. And if people actually want to focus maybe on a number of different elements in an order, um, maybe a one, two, three, four order, a bit like what I've done, that, that would be fine as well. And also, bear in mind, I mean, I'm sure people are aware of it from what I've described, but this is a really busy, a really time-poor audience. They needed learning re literally at their fingertips. And ultimately, they needed to reach that level seven, which is that evidence of thought leadership. You can think about most leadership programs really needing to aim for that. They've got to get their, their leaders thinking within that, you know, much more original way. I'm sure everybody's thinking about it right now. Yes, it no wouldn't necessarily be good to have five minutes of radio silence <laughs> while those who are thinking about it, well, those who aren't thinking about it, wait for those who are thinking about it to answer. So what I'm going to suggest we do is that people yes. continue to put their answers in. Lovely, yeah. And lots of good stuff coming through already, actually. Opportunities Brilliant. to collaborate, have Q&A, virtual sessions, uh, move all the core learning from the four-day event, says Trevor. Mm. Um, meet and have discussions, says Maggie. Uh, Telly one is talking about using the LMS and so on. So there's lots of lots of thoughts coming through. Super. Do you want to take us through to the to your proposed I will. answer? Well, not your proposed, your actual answer. What you actually yes, did. What we actually did. I'll do that now. So I'm going to show you first of all the overall solution, and then I'll go through the four stages uh, broken down across the 12 month time span, and then we'll leave it open for questions after that. So here it is as a whole. So I think you can see, I'll just give you a minute or two just to see um, some of the different elements I've actually used here for one, M learning video. We've got coaching, coaching activities, reflective notes. Then we've got the learning event itself. And then we've got the follow-up. So let's start at the first stage. There we go. So what I've done here is, um, also, to sort of help clarify some of the links to the uh, levels that I've been talking about, I've just included that comparative definition on the right-hand side. But the main thing to actually um, look at is this section here. So prior to the learning event, the information and concept exploration, what we did was um, core information and thought-provoking questions about breakthrough performance coaching. So that was quite important because it actually also integrated people into the very particular language of breakthrough performance coaching. These were actually delivered through a customized mobile app. And then video scenarios um, about the leadership program were delivered through Learn Now, which is Tata's self-authoring platform. Uh, this works on both company and personal devices. And this meant you know, that we weren't interpreting what the subject matter experts were doing, that they were able to put forward their own um, bits of information themselves and send these things through to people to have a look at before and consider before the event. And of course, employees were able to access the M learning wherever they were and as many times as they liked. They were quite excited actually about being able to integrate themselves into mobile learning. So it's very exciting. Um, element for them. So the second stage of the solution, experiential engagement, this is also prior to the learning event. Because I think if you remember I was talking to you, you know, they provided quite a lot of, you know, really valuable kind of coaching sessions um, uh, uh, for, 
for their potential leaders. And what we did was we created a reflective notes capability within the app. This is for learners to use before and after uh, the, the breakthrough performance coaching sessions. The learners were both often were both coach and coachy, it depended you know what kind of meeting they were having. And uh, a lot of them were, were real. They weren't set up. They, they, were, they were genuinely coaching somebody or they were genuinely being coached by somebody. So this meant that they could use the app to fill in notes about their sessions using the app's guided questions and prompts or as they got more confident without them. And they were encouraged to do this um, as part of their preparation for the learning event. So basically, the reflective notes were there to capability. That was there to help learners embed the core concepts, the core knowledge within their practice before the actual event. Jo, a couple of questions coming through, which are, yeah. I think, very relevant to this stage. No uh, Helen has asked, and you may have answered this already, can you tell us yes. a bit more about what the M learning involved, actually, what the mobile learning actually Yes, involved? it was actually really quite simple. I mean, um, you know, I don't know how many people have had experience of actually designing for mobile learning, but it's, it's quite a different experience, actually, from designing for e-learning, e something that people look, you know people are going to look through a desktop or a laptop. You know, with e-learning, you, you know that you can um, almost stage little spectacular um, things for people to interact with, and uh, they'll, they'll sit down and they'll give themselves that time, potentially, to go through it stage by stage. Whereas with the minute something seems to be on a mobile, everybody's quickly swiping and it's, come on, come on, come on, get things through. You know, I need this here as quickly as possible. People are quite impatient. You know, there's a, there's a different kind of approach that people have towards receiving information through the mobile phone. So the way we designed it was that it was quite visual, uh, pictures. It was very, very to the point about how this was actually going to be a tool to help them. There was some key information, um, you know, we, we, had, we had questions, but we also had, you know, pictures. As I said, we had a video as well. Um, it was very straightforward information because people were just like, right, I want to know what it is. Um, great, I understand it. Now how can I use it? Because I know that next week I've got a meeting or a coaching session and I'm supposed to be using this for that. So it was right. quite... Very good. So, direct. Okay, that's good. Now, there's just one other, um, well, actually, there's lots of questions coming through. I don't want to have them all now and break up your flow, but there's right. just one thing which I think is very relevant at this stage from, from Dave, and we'll come back, Con and Malcolm, to your questions yes. in a minute. No, actually, Malcolm, this is a good one. What was the lead in time from the initiation of projects to the delivery? Mm. Well, it, we obviously would have preferred it to be a bit longer, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it was just a couple of months. So we had to get some of our things through done quite quickly. Okay. Um, and so it was a very intense time when we were actually gathering information. We worked very, very closely and very hard with the people, uh, with the clients. who They had a number of fantastic subject matter experts who really knew, you know, their stuff back to front. So, you know, we were fortunate. There were people that really knew what they were doing there. But, yeah, it was, I think, two to three months, and it had to be there to allow time to people to actually properly use it before okay. um, before the event. Ideally, we would have preferred it six months because we would have liked to, We and in the future we will, because we'll be doing a lot more preparation before the next event next year. Dave and Con, we'll deal with your questions in a minute, but I don't want to interrupt the flow of Jo as she goes okay. through the story. Go on. No problem. So um, I'll take you through to the third stage here, which was the actual learning event. Um, demonstration and application. Um, so um, essentially, sorry, I just dropped something. The four-day learning event was designed around participants sharing experiences, sharing their reflective notes, and taking part in crafted applied learning activities. Because obviously, you know, people came in there; they knew that they were expected to already know about it. And so the uh, people who were running the class, uh, running the learning event, were able to basically build on a foundation of knowledge that was already there. Um, and because most of the core information delivery had already taken place before the event, the emphasis then at this kind of stage it is much less on just getting it right, and much much more on sharing a mature learning experience. So the events basically went much better. 
And then we've got the post-learning event. So this is the area which allows learners to progress beyond the training. But I would certainly say there were areas within the actual learning event itself where that happened as well. So here now we have follow-up questions, scenarios, and also post-event evaluation tasks being delivered through the Learn Now self-authoring platform. You know, basically as much or as little as the client themselves wants to put through to their learners. They know their own audience, you know, way better than we do. So they can paste that and push it through. Um, the learners are continuing to use the app's reflective notes capability. It was always put forward that it wasn't just sort of a training uh, tool, that it was something you genuinely could use in your job. Um, and also, in going back in, which we obviously are starting to do now because the events happened in October, uh, one of the things we want to talk about them is how they can set up a genuine um, sh uh, sharing social uh, communication for people who've actually attended this event. So, the, you know, the, that, that, so that continues to go forward, that they don't lose the impetus. So the, um, the learning is ongoing. But it's viewed as a useful, contributory part of people's job instead of separate from it. So here's the summarized solution again with all four stages of the flipped learning model diagram. I guess just to sum it up, the, the idea was to create an experience that was meaningful for each individual, but it was also social and contributory and that we created places for the learner to transform themselves and others along the way. So now I'm, I'm going to leave that up there so people just have another little look at it. But um, I'll over, over to the guys really for some questions. There are I've, lots of I've questions particularly about this. So uh, in fact, the, the, as you can see, the text area is, um, is filling up quite nicely. Yeah. Uh, let me just, um, I have my own special technique for doing this. Um, I'll start with Dave, because we missed him out earlier on. Uh, Dave's question was, was there resistance to taking reflective notes? And if so, how was that overcome? I think, in, I think the way, it was the way you word it, really. Um, I mean, I, I'll, I'll just go back to my own teaching extent, which is what I often fall back on, you know, as having been a learner myself uh, within a you know, teacher training. I remember when I was first told that I had to keep a learning journal, I thought, oh, no, you know, and then we were told, well, it's going to be looked at. That was even worse. Um, and yes, you can feel quite impatient about it. But I think if you set it in as a task and you say for a specific, as we say, we said it's for a specific event, you're going to be using it. You're going to be so glad that you've got those notes when you come to this event because you are going to be expected to know what it is that everybody is talking about and to be able to contribute. I think then, you know, that gets people over the initial hump of actually not maybe wanting to use it. They don't want to be shown up. So that's where the use of actually a classroom event, a live classroom event, where you're actually going to be meeting people and you're going to be sitting there either with a, a blank sheet or rather a blank phone or, um, or a full one. Um, I think that's kind of effective. <laughs> We've got um, a, a sort of related question from Amanda and other people as well, actually, about getting people to do stuff before an mm. event. And she's saying she's trying to make this happen, but it, she's found it difficult to get yeah. people to do it because they're time poor. Yeah. What do you do to enable slash empower learners to take responsibility mm. for their own learning before the face-to-face -face events? To which Lee's answer was, do you have to be more strict if they do not complete mm. the pre-course and they can't uh, do it? Although mm. we had some other comments earlier on that suggested that that... In, practical way in the workplace might be quite difficult to actually yeah. do. Although Lee says, Lee sticks to his guns and says, if they do not complete the pre-coursework, they're wasting everybody's time. Yeah. All right, so what was your take on in this particular circumstance? Again, about? I mean, it's tricky because, yeah. and it's a valid question, because these people are potential leaders and you can't turn around and sort of say, be very naughty, you're not coming. Um, I think the other thing that was helpful is the coaching sessions in between, because in effect, everybody had to have, you know, it had mentors and they were expected to mentor each other. So there was almost like a run of job-related tasks, genuine ones that were happening um, between the uh, giving of the app and the tasks and the actual learning event. So it's almost like we, we really did really try with the, with the uh, client team 
to make sure it was very much linked to something that they recognised was a really important part of their job. You know, um, how, can I just interrupt, Joe? What, how much of that was the learning department doing that, and how much of it was managers and other in the org others in the organisation providing a sort of culture stroke peer expectation yeah. so that yeah. would take place? Well, I think the, the, the I'm really glad you brought up the thing about culture. The leadership team for this client that really was a, a big focus for them, that they wanted to create a culture of um, mentoring and supporting and, as I say, you know, even the use of the language within Breakthrough Performance Coaching was something, you know, that they wanted everybody to understand and use in a meaningful way. Um, so it was very much led by this core leadership team that was responsible for the event and the whole program. It was specialised. Um, and in effect, they made the time to sort of uh, check what was coming back through, what the reports were coming back through from the different attendees that were, mm -hmm. were due to be attending this. Yep. So you do sort of have to be a bit on their case. But, you know, if you've got something, as I say, you need to, you've got a lot of pressure on to achieve at a very high level, that level seven, then that is the only way that you're actually going to be able to do it. And having a structure for evaluation so people can turn around and say, you haven't, we need you to achieve this, and you haven't quite got that. You haven't quite applied that yet to the context of your own experience. This is, this is what, if you do this, that will show us evidence that you're able to do that. And Will, will is sort of is backing up your idea that, there was, that, that peer pressure was useful Absolutely. here. The motivation to complete the pre-work was peer Absolutely. pressure. These are, these are senior leaders. They don't want to be exposed as, as not being prepared, which I think mm. is a fair point. There was another couple of points raised which were, I think uh, useful. P Paul said it's not. A, we shouldn't be victimising people who no. genuinely can't complete the work. Um, but Jim raised the point that we you have to show that the work and the learning is valued in the organisation, mm. and that's where that comes back to the point of peer pressure. Yeah. If the culture's right in the first place, then uh, that that will uh, make it happen. If it's not right in the first place, then there's very little I think you probably can do. Mm. Um, reflective notes says Jim. He says, I often find, too often find that students in education, that is, in particular, think it's about how they felt. So mm. how did you actually ensure that anything about reflective notes went down the path you wanted it to yes. and didn't become a, an exercise in navel-gazing? That's a really, thank you for bringing that up. That was one of the things that we, the Tata team in particular, oh gosh, we worked on this so hard. We wanted to make sure that People weren't just left, as you say, in the dark, thinking, I've got to say, I feel very upset about this. <laughs> you know, some people really enjoy it, and some people go, oh, I think that's really fluffy. We, we actually made sure that we had a set of guided questions, basically, um, that went through um, so that if someone was, say, having a meeting and they wanted to do a little bit of preparation for it, these guidances, these um, um, guided questions, really, we called them, um, actually allowed people to, th to get them into the framework of thinking that we actually wanted them to think about beforehand. And then, again, we found that a lot, a lot of the questions were quite cyclical again. And so if they filled in notes afterwards, again, you could often use quite a, a, the same set of guidances. Um, I know that um, uh, Will um, is, and the Tata team, I'm sure they'll be happy to put up some examples within a, a demo link for anybody who's actually interested. That would be really useful. If you could do that, Will, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, Stephen Goodwin said, look, design it so that the learners deliver a learning task to the teacher mm. in the pre-work. Actually, mm. that just reminds me of my university days when yeah. I was effectively writing two essays a week. Yeah. And, you know, you, the task was you turned up with something, you delivered it, and, and uh, you either deliver it to, to your uh, tutor or you stand mm. up and deliver it to a small group. Yeah. And you're going to, nobody is going to want to turn up and not have something well prepared, exactly. particularly if they're delivering it to a group. So that, that's a good idea, Stephen, and others have noted that and given you a, a big thumbs yeah. up for it. More stuff coming in here that I can actually handle. No problem. Um, it, well, no, but it's, it's not a problem. It's, it's marvellous. Let's just make sure that I can pull through uh, enough stuff that's really valuable. Alex Watson says, I first did something similar to this around four years ago. Pre-course reading and reflection, online virtual session, post-session follow-up, one-to-one telephone calls to go over mm -hmm. difficulties. It's easier to achieve it with a small demographic. Yes. 
Yeah. It is. There's, there's lots of semantic arguing going on at the moment about whether we call it pre-work, post-course, or whatever. Mm. And Lee, uh, perhaps, was what, what looks like perhaps characteristic acerbicness is saying, it doesn't matter, or the learner doesn't care what you call it. Uh, if they don't wish to complete it, they won't. That's right. Uh, and actually, within this situation, you know, um, you've got to put it, if someone doesn't want to put the effort into becoming a potential leader within their organization, then fine, that's actually their choice. I think that's the other reason that's as well a very for good making point, sure Joe. that the yeah. learning is is there. Your set, you take responsibility for your learning right from the beginning, and and that there's somebody there to help you. Yep. If you, it's not about spoon feeding, um, not in any way, shape, or form, and you, and you know some of those learning environments can, you know, I'm aware they can be quite frightening for people because we're all used to the old-fashioned spoon feeding. feeding yeah. Um, yep. type of teaching yep. um, so this is very much about sitting down sharing things there's not maybe a very clear um, um, way forward and can feel quite organic and why are we talking about this you know what back in school I was never allowed to talk for more than one minute here we are all sitting around in a group talking for an hour um, there's all sorts of things that people especially of a certain age are, are not going to be used to but I generally found, and I've, I've done this you know, within live classrooms myself as well as within these blended learning solutions, that very, very quickly people really enjoy it. They love it that they have a voice within these situations. And, um, and it, people can look back and just see what it is that they've actually contributed to their own le and learning. To, and typically they do feel they are getting something out of it. As Rose mm -hmm. says, the quality of the learning and participation is so much better yes. when they've done the work in advance. Mm -hmm. Now, coming back to this pre-course, post-course mm. nomenclature stuff, Colin Steed says we are still thinking courses and not learning experiences, which, yes, which brings me back to a, a bunch of questions that came up about the event in the middle. Mm. Um, Dawn said, or sorry, Lee said he was surprised that the event remained at four days, and the, the, uh, the idea was perhaps you could trim some time off there because people were doing more stuff on their own time. But Sally said, not so surprised about the four-day thing, because the time to reflect and consolidate learning yes. with peers is important. Yes. So can you just reflect on, on why, because a lot of people would have expected you to yes. save money and save time, they, you didn't. So why was that? I, uh, this is one of the ones I was, thing, I was actually checking and some of the follow-up to yeah. what was actually happening with this client. And I was interested to see if they would actually chop it down. But no, absolutely not. And for the reason that it was Laura, wasn't it, that said, is that it, it, it was recognized by the leadership team that they wanted to give people proper time to think. That one of the problems they've been having with the previous learning events is it was just delivery, 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 absorb, absorb, absorb. Back to work, really you gap. can't do anything about it. No. No, because your head's already full of doing the work. Exactly. And there's, you know, what you have to do, that, that's the whole point. If we go back to the simple school version, you know, you don't say, oh, just because someone's, you know, had the chance to go through, and on, a student's gone through an online video about 10 times, brilliant, they've got it, um, and they've, you know, I can tell from their online communication that they understand it. Okay, they don't need, you know, uh, a full day's class. They, they can just maybe do something in an hour. That's almost like a, a, a retrograde approach, really. The whole point is to free up that time so that people have that quality learning time to take them up to those levels. Which is the whole... Yeah. Meaning the word flipped in flipped exactly. classroom. You're flipping it around so that the you're carving out space in the day. This fits very nicely with yeah. what Laura was talking about at 10 o'clock, about our increasingly busy lives. Mm. The reality is that most people simply don't have time to mm. think. And certainly if they're working full time, they don't have time to um, try to sandwich in some... Mm particularly conceptual thinking. Yes. Uh, I was reading uh, Daniel Kuhneman's book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, over the summer. Mm. My son said to me, Dad, why did you keep putting that book down? I said, I have to keep thinking about yes. it. It's such a dense, well-written, mm. thought-provoking book that you just simply can't run through it. Yes. Now, if I, I, I simply couldn't do that. I had to do it over the whole day. I couldn't do it during the day-to-day -day life because it was just, there's too much going on. Yes. That's the reality of life for most managers. And uh, interesting, I'm, gonna, I'm getting that from a lot of people I'm talking to. Mm. Con says, so Joanne, has the flipped classroom um, had a smooth transition from education to the organization? This is a question Con asked earlier. Um, so we've got it here in the organization. Your example is good, but how widespread is such a learning model across the corporate world? Well, I think we can answer that, Con, but I'll let okay. Joe answer it. 
<laughs> um, so is it widespread and are the people at the top comfortable with the whole idea? Well, I think this is one of the reasons why we've talked about it today and why I've been showing the diagram. It's, it's because um, a number of us who've been working within blended learning for quite a number of years and work with clients that are quite sophisticated, you know, they, they've gone through a whole number of, you know, looking at all the way technology has changed, you know, especially over the last 15 years. Um, and how training has adapted and incorporated or rejected different different things. Um, that the what they're finding is is that they do understand the need for, as you say, carving out this space, and you know they have a sense of urgency about making sure people are genuinely uh, reaching these levels, not just doing like a multiple choice tick box thing, that they then find out in practice people aren't really understanding it at all. So, um, um, but as, uh, that carving of that, I suppose, holistic space for people to think in that more conceptual way and, raise, and reach those higher levels still can be feel very hazy, very blurred, and then, as I say, to, to, to add to it, you know, you've got all these amazing different kinds of learning technologies, learning tools. I mean, Tata gets this quite a lot because they they can produce all sorts of really fantastic things. They've got a huge portfolio of stuff. And as I say, people just like dive in there and it's like sweeties. Um, but really, the only thing really that is going to ensure that it works, and quite often this is, and this is why we use this diagram a lot, this four stage diagram yeah, here, yeah. is it enables people to grasp straight away that there is actually a structure to it. There's a process, which yeah. in the past, the process and the structure has been the space. Yes. The physical classroom, and this gives them a conceptual model that goes beyond that. Joe, so I'm, I'm, I can see as, I'm, as you're chatting, the, the scroll bar is edging its way up because more and more people are throwing stuff into the text chat area. Mm. I'm, going to, I'm going to ask you to, to um, be as quick as you can with the answers now yes, as I, I throw more stuff at you and ask you to make observations. So very interesting here. Um, Andrew said, the point is it's no pain, no gain. And Paul backs up and says, yeah, absolutely. it's about the learner taking responsibility for their own learning. That's a bit of a cultural shift. Um, do you think that, that um, the organizations you've worked with mm -hmm. are happy to make that cultural shift where the responsibility is placed at the door of the learner uh, rather than being something which they are, as you use the word, spoon-fed? I think as long as they can see a very clear evaluation point. Okay, now somebody asked earlier was there, what, about evaluation. How is it done? Did any learners self-evaluate? Um, I think, you know, making sure that there's, um, you know, we, we, they could record the notes on the app. So there were things they could um, uh, basically transfer that to. So people were overlooking what they were actually contributing. I mean, obviously, when you're, there were, there were different questions and things, and we also wanted what we want to do in the future with this model, uh, with this, sorry, not with this model, with this uh, particular project, is we want to start ask, getting them to do much more involved question, uh, questioning bases in relation to things like video scenarios, um, et cetera, things that are more complex and maybe a whole range of shades of gray situations. And when people start being able to use that, then we can record the answers to the questions. Um, you know, this, as I say, at this level, we're not looking for multiple choice single answers. They'll be much more what people actually think about it. Far so, complex answers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, just to make the point, Will uh, says the other change the client made was to reduce from two times four day events uh, mm. a year to have just a single four day event. So that is mm. a substantial reduction. Mm. Um, Rose says often people only look at the advanced material the night before an event and having it available in different mediums yeah. helps them prepare en route. Well, that's really good. Also, of course, having it available in different media enables them to see it in different ways at different times mm. and enables the process of uh, repetition and, mm. and learning from that. Um, And I'm also looking at yeah. Wolf's comment, you know, a very good one, quote from the employer, if our learners are responsible for our own learning, what are we paying you for then? Well, someone's got to set up the structure and the resources and the whole framework for them to actually learn by themselves. 
So, you know, it's, uh, as we've talked about before, it is, it is a mindset change and it is a cultural shift and we have to get over people's previous experience of, of classroom teaching. But I think people, I'm finding people much, much more open to that. The uh, short answer to that question, of course, is, well, if they are responsible for their own learning and they're not, mm. and that's why you need us. Yeah. because we can create the structure and the environment in which it will happen. Yeah. Stephen Goodwin asks, how can the Kolb experiential learning cycle relate mm. to performance-driven backward design, mm. <laughs> getting performance learning on the job without the four days of information push? Yes. Isn't well, I'm not saying it's an ideal means? to have a four-day learning event. It's just yeah. that with this particular example, and we, we obviously do have, I have lots of different other kinds of examples oh. of different things that I've used this model for. Um, it's just that that was established for that particular client. People really look forward to that learning event. It probably it had some cu cultural significance within it the organisation. It really was. It was the one time they all got yeah. together. Yeah. Um, and they enjoyed it and it was fun for them. And, um, and, you know, and it was like a key feature of this 12-month programme. So you know, the impetus was always for it to be there. So we were kind of lucky. We didn't have to justify that. Okay, uh, and I, but I, Olaf, I do, I do take it as a question, and I think that it's a question to which we should answer, not in a servile way, but quite aggressively. And mm -hmm. my, so my response is, yeah, look, yeah, they are responsible for learning, so mm -hmm. you've obviously not done a very good job of helping them do it, and that's why you're going to pay us to make mm -hmm. it possible. Mm -hmm. um, somebody asked me what, what the book was. The book is called Thinking Fast and Slow. Just, just Google Thinking Fast and Slow, you'll find it. Um, Universities are still very much, as Lee, in the model of come to a lecture several times a week. Mm. Um, and he says his stepson finds it hard to keep awake. Uh, Lee, I, um, I went to two lectures at university because I thought that was such a rubbish way of conveying information. Uh, it, it, is, it is an observation that is completely um, correct, I'm afraid. Mm. Um, Andy Napier says, if you have experienced one session facilitated by Harvard professors to review a case study, mm. you will never again not prepare slash complete pre-course reading. <laughs> and if I could be crude about it, as the Americans would say, because I'm just coming from the States, yeah. they're totally down on your ass. Yeah. They're going to give you a good kicking if you haven't got yeah. it. And that's because they've got the prestige to do it. Mm -hmm. And they've got the cultural significance in the organization. So... Um, I was talking to somebody who's running an induction process at Thomson Reuters in New York, mm. and they, they, would, they got some advice, and they said that they, were, they, they had started off being quite sort of um, fluffy about it, but it then it got quite tough in the induction, mm. and everybody yeah. responded positively, stepped up, the yeah. level of learning was much higher, mm. because the person had asserted themselves. And I think it, it, this is something which we need to be doing far more often. Some I practical mean, questions. Anise asked okay. earlier how much did it cost. Then some other questions here. How large was the team? And how and when did you set up the mentoring team? Which, which team? How large was which team? I'm not quite sure. Anise, can you, um, exp uh, I think probably your development team. Our development team, well, actually, yeah, there was quite a few of us. I mean, there was um, certainly I was working, I was working with Rohan, who's a fantastic uh, senior instructional designer at Tata. So we were the two kind of key people looking very closely um, at everything that was coming in and working with the client. And then we, because of the different kinds of resources, because we have lots of different kinds of teams, we have, you know, the mobile learning team, the mobile app development team, serious game team, um, uh, the simulation team, and anything that pe key people from that will actually be involved in that whole initial process. So we probably had about eight people looking very, very closely about this and, and us all discussing. And a, lot, a lot of people say, oh, right, well, it's easy for them. They've got that many people. <laughs> is it possible to do it with fewer people? I think it's the main thing is, is who's got the expertise, um, you know, to make sure that that resource is just about as good as you can possibly get it to be. Yeah. So, you know, as I say, we're fortunate we've got quite a large team. But, um, you know, if it was a smaller company, I've worked with smaller companies before, and had to do quite a lot of things myself as well. You call yeah. on a number of skill sets. It's, you know, what you've got to the best of your ability to create that resource in the most fantastic way you can. I've dropped the links into the um, URL tracker box there. Hopefully you can now read those quite easily. Yes, and and uh, copy. If there's an issue with that, please let me know. Mm -hmm. Obviously we're here to help rather than to create stuff that is difficult. Now, just so what I would say, um, just on, in the last note, is that um, 
I'm still, I don't, you know, this has emerged from some research that I did with Brighton University over a couple of years. Of course, yes. And um, I'm still working on it. I'm still bringing in the case studies. Uh, one of the key case studies I had was actually an induction program, funnily enough, Donald. Mm. Um, you know, very, very tricky one, very difficult, very important. It was a health and safety one, actually. Um, so I'm still bringing in the uh, results from that, but um, you know, hopefully I'll have a white paper, you know, by the beginning of next year, and then you know people can go and have a look at that, um, and there'll be more sort of information really in, in relation to this that looks at other different kinds of ways you can actually adapt this model, you know, and some of the you know crucial things like what works, what doesn't. Well, thank you very much. I think I have to say, somebody said earlier, I really appreciate Joe's structured measured approach to this subject oh, and, and I, I totally agree I think this has been a really nicely put together webinar in mm. terms of that it's got very useful content it's got solid academic backing plenty of examples we've never had a webinar before where we stop at 20 minutes before the end and say right here's a case study give us the answer and then talk about it mm. actually it's proved to be tremendously I'd love the answers hasn't it been fantastic tremendously fantastic. stimulating yeah so, I think I might have a really good look at that through them, you know, in terms of my research that I'm still doing as well. well so fantastic. thank you very much for everybody for contributing. Really invaluable. It, is, it has been invaluable. We, 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 104 people still with us now. Uh, so we've had plenty of people contributing. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for chipping in and contributing. Yeah. Of course, I have to thank uh, Joe again for doing such a great job. I'm well, thank you for inviting me, Donald. Well, really, really good. Good. And this is your first webinar you've, you've done? It is. I mean, you know, I've said a lot of nice that? Teaching. Can you believe that, people? <laughs> what a pro! You've done a great job. Um, Thank you. I'm going to. Um, I'm going to quickly go on to my own. Oh dear, dear. There we are. My own little bits and bobs. LSG webinar um, is the hashtag to use. Give um, Joe your plaudits. Joe, of course, from Tata Interactive, doing a great job there, taking us through something that's very important, but not in a wishy-washy armchair, arm-waving way. Plenty of fact. Plenty of experience, lots of insight. That's what we love here. Super. Um, of course, you'll be able to get everything afterwards. The recording, slides, web chats will be available at the Learning and Skills Group. Sorry, at www.learningandskillsgroup.com. So please go there, and you'll you should be live tomorrow. If not tomorrow afternoon, if not, it'll be Monday. There's just we have a technical issue of downloading the the, the actual webinar recording itself. But that's what takes the time. Of course, Learning and Skills Group, free community, 6,000 people. Please chip in if you're not already a member. It costs you nothing, and you get to meet and have chats like this with everybody all the time. Look at all these people saying you're a star. You are a star, Joe. Oh, Jack. thank you One very much. One of the best much. sessions I've ever attended, says Theresa oh, from wonderful. Sheringham. Wonderful, nice wonderful. Well, it's say, brilliant feedback. Thanks Next webinars much. are on 21st of November 2013, and it will be great to have you there. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending, for participating, and for sharing your thoughts, an invaluable part of the session. Once again for her well-structured, well-delivered, fact-based and insight-topped webinar. Thank you very much. Joe Corey of Tata Interactive Systems. Thank you all. Bye-bye.